Thanks for having me and a big thank you to, to Mike for the invitation. Um, I'm a big fan of the Broomfield Veterans Museum and I've worked quite a bit with, uh, with Flint and with Dave Little and, and of course your curator Elizabeth as well. Um, so I've attended a few of these in the past and I'm excited to, to actually deliver one of my own. Um, so Mike and I discussed that we would actually start the presentation with a little bit of an overview of what happens in my, in my day job at History Colorado and just fill you in on some of those other military history resources that you have uh, nearby here. Um, so at History Colorado for the past four years, I've been the curator of military history there. That was a, a new position created um, through support of the Unschutz Foundation. Um, and now I also have, a, a for over a year now, I have had a teammate, um, Sidney Mock, who's our Anschutz uh, military collection specialist. Um, so the collection that we have at History Colorado, it is the state collection, so we are the State Historical Society. Um, and the military collection dates all the way back to the origins of the society in 1879. Uh, um, so we've been around for quite a while, um, and the military collection was one of the first core collections. In fact, the first curator of the State Historical Society was a Civil War veteran um, who brought in a lot of Civil War items uh, from, his own, uh, from his own holdings as well as uh, pieces that he traded with curators on the East Coast from the various battlefields there. Um, so we have a really impressive Civil War collection that kind of kick-started everything. Um, we have items that date even older than that, all the way back to the French and Indian War. We have a powder horn. Um, and then bringing it all the way forward to the global war on terror. Uh, we're an actively collecting institution and we get collections in, new collections every month. Um, a lot of it recently has been World War II focused, which is great, that's one of my favorite subjects. Um, and so we've gotten in a lot about the USS Colorado, about Army uh, Hospital at Fitzsimmons, um, and, and lots to do with the 10th Mountain Division as well. Um, and in fact, we are uh, um, in a shared role with the Denver Public Library, we are home to the 10th Mountain Division Resource Center. So this is the national repository for all things related to the World War II 10th Mountain Division. Um, so Denver Public Library on their side of the street has tens of thousands of documents and photographs and scrapbooks and morning reports and that sort of thing, anything 2D. And all the 3D stuff is on our side of the street. So we have over 4,000 artifacts that date back to uh, the division's World War II service. Um, here's some examples, um, everything large and small. Um, we do a lot of processing work with the collection, then that's where my, my counterpart, Sydney, comes in. Um, a lot of preservation work and long-term storage, because um, obviously we want to ensure that these pieces are going to be in, in good condition and available to the general public for, for decades to come. Um, so you can see some of that work here. We recently rehoused um, our entire uniform collection in, in flat storage, which is better for, for long-term use. Um, as well as our long arms are now all stored vertically. Um, that was a, a recent change. We went through all 300 of our long arms. Um, we also do a lot of digitization for our collections. Um, so here's an example of some of the 1,300 images of the USS Colorado battleship that were recently digitized. Um, we also rely heavily on the help of some wonderful volunteers to help us get all that work done, um, including quite a few who now are in our new exhibit gallery. Speaking of which, um, one of the other jobs that we do, of course, is interpretation and exhibits. Um, and if you haven't had a chance yet to come down and see the new 10th Mountain Division exhibit, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, we opened it on Veterans Day last year um, at over 5,000 square feet. It's the largest public telling of the story that we've, that we've ever had. Um, and we have hundreds of, of photographs and artifacts on display that take the story all the way from the Russo-Finnish War um, through the Italian campaign. Um, we do a lot of programs um, in schools and in, in, in various public venues and with community centers and, and with other museums such as yours. Um, we do some digital work as well, um, so some exhibits that can be viewed online and, and some programs that are completely virtual. And we work quite a bit with a lot of different community organizations, veterans organizations, active military, that sort of thing. Um, but now I'll back up a little bit and get to the topic of the talk here and, and back up quite a bit in terms of the time frame. Um, so way before Colorado history. Um, and so this actually dates back to, it's, it's been a while since I've had to kind of think about this subject. This is, a, this is a topic I worked on in graduate school. This was the subject of my dissertation. Um, and it really was because I was a, a grad student in upstate New York um, at Binghamton University. And I really wanted to be an Eastern Front historian. Um, I grew up in Germany, and I, and I speak fluent German. I started taking Russian classes, and that was kind of the ambition. Um, but there was a particular graduate seminar where I needed to have a research paper. And uh, you know, the National Archives were a little too far away, and the German Archives certainly so. Um, but a friend of mine who was an early Americanist said, hey, you know, down the road in Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania, there's an awful lot of German documents you could work on for a, for a quick seminar paper. 
Um, and these documents were related to the Hessians who served during the American Revolution. So I thought, well, that's, that sounds like a fun topic for one semester. Um, but I went down there and kind of fell in love with the subject. And, and sure enough, it became the topic of my dissertation then. Um, so I spent the next many years uh, working on this, on this subject. And there's quite a bit that's misunderstood about the Hessians. Um, but it's also just a fascinating story that I'm, that I'm excited to share with all of you. So the story really starts in the mid-1770s, so before conflict erupts in the rebellious American colonies, um, the Britons already know that something is, something is brewing and that trouble might be coming. Um, very often when we hear the story of you know, the shot heard around the world, um, it makes it sound like the Britons were surprised um, by, by what was happening, and, and that's certainly not so. Um, and in fact, as early as 1774, uh, the Crown started looking into a military solution to the problem of colonial unrest. Um, and really what they decided was that the easiest way to squash any kind of unhappy feelings in the, in the American colonies would be with a rapid and overwhelming military response. Um, so basically to send over as many troops as they could find to occupy the major urban centers um, and, and dissuade any colonists from, from any sort of rebellious uprisings. Um, now, the Britons had another problem, though, and that is, of course, that, uh, you know, in less than two decades before, they had been involved in the Seven Years' War, um, over here known as the French and Indian War. Um, that had been an incredibly costly conflict, um, both in, in terms of the, the financial cost, but the human cost as well. Um, and the people of Great Britain were tired of, of high taxes and of being <laughs> drafted into the army and, and being sent overseas on these, on these uh, imperial expeditions. And so... The Brits thought, you know, for, for an immediate response like this, we can't go to the British public. Um, and we can't go to the, to the, uh, to the British Army um, either. Um, the, the Army was spread out all over the British Empire. They had many other obligations. Um, and they certainly didn't have a reserve of, uh, a large enough reserve of troops that they could send for such a mission either. Um, so they needed a lot of troops, they needed them quickly, and they didn't want to draft them from the British public. So where did they go? Well, they went to Germany. And so a little bit of background here, what ends up becoming critically important to the story is the German soldier trade, known as the Soldatenhandel in German. Um, this dates back to, uh, well, actually, even earlier than this, but it became sort of infamous during the Thirty Years' War, um, so 1618 to 1648. Um, Germany at this point was, um, let me see if I have the map here, yeah. Um, so this is a little bit later, so this is um, after reorganization. But even here, you can see all these colorful blotches over what is now called Germany. Um, and they were hundreds of independent principalities and states um, during, the, during the Thirty Years' War. Um, they were all loosely bound together by something known as the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and there were, uh, I think it was Voltaire who famously quipped that, you know, it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. <laughs> um, but it was this conglomeration of states. Uh, it was largely, a, you know, a system of, of economic cooperation and some limited defense cooperation. Um, and during the Thirty Years' War, it became the, the battleground for the larger states surrounding them from all sides, um, including the Swedes to the north, the French, the Austrians, um, rampaging across uh, Germany and, and causing tremendous devastation. Um, a lot of these smaller states then became the recruiting grounds for soldiers for that conflict. Um, and so during the, the early version of the soldier trade, what you had was basically mercenary captains uh, who were roaming the German countryside and recruiting as many farmers as they could, um, equipping them either with, with pikes, that was the easiest formation to train up, um, or if you had some time to actually get them trained, you might be able to raise some musket uh, troops as well. Um, but so you had these pike and shot formations that were assembled by these mercenary captains. Um, and they became quite powerful. Um, you may have heard of Albrecht von Wallenstein. He's the most famous. Um, he actually rose to such prominence that he effectively became a ruler in Central Europe. He um, actually got permission from the emperor who hired him to raise his own territorial state. Um, so as he went around conquering and, and fighting the emperor's enemies, um, he set up his own quasi-kingdom um, in what is now the, the Czech Republic. Um, he eventually grew so powerful that uh, his, his own, uh, the, the own emperor who had hired him uh, ended up hiring some assassins to take him out because he was worried that he was getting a little too powerful. Um, but so that's some of the background of what the soldier trade looked like during the Thirty Years' War. So by the time you get to the 18th century, there are some changes, but the soldier trade is still around. Um, but the major change is, is that these German princes no longer trusted mercenary captains to go around their lands recruiting people. Um, and as states became more powerful, as taxation became more centralized and they started raising more funds, um, you know, states started seeking standing armies. That, that was really the, the best way to defend your country was to have a standing army. Um, 
that worked just fine in, in Austria and France and Britain. Um, but in Germany, with this conglomeration of these smaller states that were all, I mean, very small in size and certainly small in treasury, um, that was going to be a challenge. So in order to raise a standing army that they couldn't afford, what they basically did is they would rent out their entire army. Um, so they would sign into contracts with the larger states around them whenever they had wars, and the empires around them had wars all the time. Um, but so they would come to these German principalities and rent out whole regiments at a time. Mm -hmm. And so basically these smaller German princes and bishops, in, in, in some cases, um, basically became the new mercenary captains. Um, so they were, in, you know, they were the sovereigns of their, of their state's armies, um, and they rented them out wholesale uh, to any power that they, that they uh, signed contracts with. So when, in the 1770s, the Britons were facing this problem, um, this was the solution. This is the same thing they had done during the Seven Years' War, and so they went back to Central Europe uh, to recruit troops um, on, uh, you know, in, such a, in a very short order and for a lot of money um, in order to avoid burdening the British public directly with, with that kind of drafting. Um, so the first thing they did was that uh, King George III, who was also a German prince himself, um, had dominion over the electorate of Hanover in the north. And so in his role as the elector of Hanover, he sent several, actually I think it was five uh, Hanoverian battalions to relieve British units elsewhere so that those British units could be sent to North America. Um, that was a good start, but it wasn't nearly enough. Um, but that was the first influence that the German uh, states had on, on that reorganization. But next they went back to the same states they had signed contracts with during the Seven Years' War. Um, very famously, they had worked together with Frederick the Great of Prussia during that conflict, um, but Frederick, uh, whose army had been devastated and lands had been devastated by the Seven Years' War, had absolutely no interest in working with the British again. Um, and in fact, the British were still behind on some of their payments <laughs> to him from that last war. Uh, so he was very critical of not only the British uh, imperial mission, um, but also he was critical of any of his neighboring uh, princes who, who dared to sign agreements with them. Um, so there's a lot of ironic statements he makes about you know, selling, uh, selling uh, their soldiers like cattle off to slaughter um, when he had done much the same thing about 15 years earlier. Um, well, so Prussia was not involved, but they went to some of these other states like the Duchy of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel or Braunschweig as it's known in German. Um, and that's where the first contingent of troops came from. They also signed agreements with the principalities of Hessen-Hanau and the small principality of Waldeck. They attempted to recruit from the Duchy of Württemberg, which actually had quite a large army, um, but was not interested in working with the British. Um, the, the, the Duke of Württemberg had uh, bigger concerns um, and was, was not interested, though he was approached by them. The Margraviate of Ansbach by Reut was interested and signed a small contract, despite being a, a very small state. Um, but then the main one that they end up signing contracts with, and which is going to be the, the kind of the primary emphasis on the talk today, is the Landgraviate of hessen kassel that you can see in the, in the center there. Um, the Landgraviate was um, a, a principality of about 300,000 people um, and ends up providing the bulk of soldiers for the British cause. In charge of that Landgraviate was Landgrave Friedrich II. Um, so he was named in honor of his uncle, who was Friedrich II of Prussia. Um, so that leads to some confusion sometimes when you read some of these 18th century letters. Um, but he was sort of an interesting character. Um, he was sort of infamous in his own time um, because, uh, as you may know, confessionalization, so the, the religion of your ruler, was incredibly important in Central Europe in the 18th century. Um, and so particularly in the Holy Roman Empire, there was a balance between Catholic and Protestant states. And the surrounding Catholic and Protestant empires had a vested interest in making sure that the religious balance remained the way it was in Germany. Um, as a young man, the Landgrave of, of, of hessen kassel um, hessen kassel had always been a, a Calvinist state, um, so on the Protestant side. Um, and for reasons that, that are really unclear to us, it probably was just legitimately personal conviction, um, young Friedrich II became enamored with Catholicism. Um, and he secretly converted to Catholicism. And when that came to light, it caused a huge international scandal. Um, and the Brits in particular were, in particular were incensed about this. Um, his father more or less disowned him. Um, he actually, I mean, there were, there were some, some special arrangements that had to be made because obviously he would be the heir to the principality. Um, so they sliced off a piece of the uh, principality known then as Hessen-Hanau. Uh, um, you'll notice from the earlier slide, they signed a separate agreement with that state, right? Um, that state was handed straight to the electors um, or to the, to the Landgrave's grandson, so Friedrich II's son, just to make sure that a good Calvinist still had a good slice of, of, the, uh, of the principality. 
Um, he was also forbidden from constructing any new Catholic churches. He was allowed to have a private Catholic chapel at his palace, but that was it. Um, and he had to sign all kinds of agreements that uh, he would in no way try to uh, encourage the spread of Catholicism in his, in his principality. Um, incidentally, just to complicate matters further, he was married to the daughter of King George II, um, which then resulted in a, in a uh, scandalous divorce from her. Um, because, of course, you know, being, she being Protestant and being part of the British Protestants, that was going to be a big problem if she was married to a Catholic. But anyway, so he was at the head of this Landgraviate of hessen kassel after all of this kerfuffle about, about Catholicism, but he was now in charge and, and ready to sign an agreement with the British. Um, and chances are good that he, that he actually used this as an occasion to sort of demonstrate to Great Britain that he would still be a reliable ally despite his change to Catholicism. Um, so let me, let me back up real quick and some more details on, on, these, on these arrangements. Um, so each of these states then signed um, individual agreements with the British government. Um, and typically these agreements involved um, hefty, uh, hefty um, bounties for the drafted soldiers. So in other words, they would pay up front for the cost of recruiting and equipping and training the soldiers that they would be hiring. Plus then, of course, they paid a rental agreement, um, what, what, affected to, uh, what amounted to a rental agreement, um, in the form of subsidies. Um, so that's, the, that's what the term that we use for these are subsidy contracts. Um, and so the subsidies they would pay would basically be this huge lump sum of money paid out um, either monthly or yearly to these principalities for as long as the campaign dragged on. And then, in most cases, the princes actually managed to arrange that those bounties would, or those uh, subsidies would be paid for a number of years after the end of the conflict as well. Um, so these were very, very expensive contracts. But the uh, British colonel, uh, William Fawcett, who was, who was put in charge of negotiating all of these and, and signing them, was basically encouraged to sign whatever the German princes wanted. Um, the British government just wanted to have as many troops as quickly as possible to send to North America. So it didn't matter to them what the terms were. Um, and what's interesting to note here is that the Brits thought that, you know, with this overwhelming force, they could either quell the uprising entirely and keep it from happening, or at the very least, they would be able to quash any kind of military resistance very quickly. So it didn't matter to them that these were hugely expensive subsidies because the war wouldn't take that long anyway. <laughs> um, and of course, that, uh, that hope would be dashed pretty quickly. Um, so Brunswick got, I mean, all of these states got, got huge subsidies. Um, but the best agreement was signed by, by the Landgraviate of Hessen-Kassel um, in terms of most advantageous to the German prince. Um, and this was largely because Hessen-Kassel was the one who was best positioned, being a relatively large um, state compared to the others, um, was best positioned to provide the largest number of soldiers. Um, the first agreement they signed was for 15,000 soldiers, um, which was basically three quarters of the army. Um, so they signed away most of the infantry regiments. They kept the guard regiments in Germany. Um, they kept the cavalry regiments in Germany and most of the artillery. Um, they did send some artillery qualified troops along to North America, but none of the guns. Um, so the Brits had to supply their own guns as well. Um, but in addition to these hefty subsidies that hessen kassel secured, they also secured some language in terms of an, an alliance with Great Britain. Um, so that in the case, because um, obviously this could be a concern, right, is when you're renting out three quarters of your army, what happens when the French invade again? <laughs> um, and so they signed an alliance into the treaty as well, um, which British Parliament uh, was very incensed about once they, once they got wind of these agreements. That became a major point of contention um, for the opposition in Parliament that did not want to uh, spend all this money and then uh, in particular was, was upset that they had made these arrangements with these small German princes where they said, what business do we have getting entangled in, in alliances in Central Europe? So they hire these soldiers, um, and shortly thereafter, after they sign these contracts, uh, war does erupt in the colonies. Um, so none of the Hessians make it over there before the first shots are fired, but they make it over there pretty quickly afterwards. Um, so the first contingents start arriving on Staten Island, in August 1776, and the second contingent lands in October of 1776. So Staten Island is where they start assembling a force to land on Long Island and then push um, in, inland from there. Um, when in August 1776 the, the Hessian troops um, land, in, land in Staten Island, um, they immediately prepare for an offensive um, onto Long Island. The landings are unopposed. Um, they manage to get onto Long Island without a problem. Um, then run into resistance a little bit inland and immediately uh, start uh, pushing, the, um, pushing the rebels back. Um, in fact, one of the Hessian officers even says, you know, if, it's, if the rest of the war is like this, it's more of a hunt than a war because the rebels are so inept. 
Um, so they had entire battalions surrendering to them. They had officers falling to their knees and begging for their lives. Um, so the early rebellion was, was uh, not, not particularly uh, well organized um, or, or uh, militarily capable of resisting against these military professionals that were coming in. Um, so the early battles on Long Island and New York were very much in the Hessian and British favor. <laughs> Um, and sort of thought, I mean, they thought this was setting the tone for the whole conflict. So the Britons were, were very optimistic about their chances early on, that they would be able to quash this, uh, this rebellion very quickly um, and, and put an end to the uprising. Um, so let's, uh, okay, so I just need to or orient myself for a second. Um, so after they, after they managed to push the rebels out of Long Island, they push onto York Island, which is Manhattan. Um, and there is a, uh, a fort. Um, today you can still see there's a couple of plaques there on Manhattan for that fort called Fort Washington at the time. Um, and that becomes the, the site of the first major Hessian victory. Um, it's a combined British and Hessian assault on the fort, um, but the Hessians take the, uh, take the brunt of the casualties and do the brunt of the fighting. Um, and the fort is renamed in honor of the, the Hessian commander who leads that assault on the northern side. Um, so it becomes named Fort Knüpphausen for General Knüpphausen. Um, they capture thousands of, of rebel soldiers, um, thousands of cannon and, and muskets and, and shot and black powder. Um, so it's a huge victory for, for the Brits. Um, and they sort of think that this is going to be the way the rest of the war goes. Um, so that's in November 1776. Um, and famously, of course, then in December, they take on positions along the Delaware River um, to prepare for the spring offensive against, against the rebellion. But now to back up for a second, so who are these Hessians? Um, so who are they recruiting? Well, you know, as I mentioned, these are the regular standing forces of the state of hessen kassel um, And basically, hessen kassel the way it was organized, was they divided the principality into smaller cantons. And then the cantons were responsible for providing troops for the various regiments. And so you sort of had this, this regular rotation of draftees that would fill up these regiments. Um, interestingly, you might know for especially 18th century, we tend to think of Prussia as sort of the prototypical militarized German state in this period. Um, one in 33 Prussians served in the army in the 18th century, which is a you know, very high percentage. In hessen kassel it was one in 15. Um, so it was twice as militarized uh, in terms of percentage as the, as the Prussian state who's so famous for being militarized. Um, so that gives you a sense of how important the army was um, to the social structure and, and political military economic structure of that state. Um, so one in 15 Hessians had to serve in the army. Um, generally speaking, uh, I mean, you wanted to avoid military service as much as possible in the 18th century. Um, it had a terrible reputation. It was a tough life. Uh, it was not well paid. Um, you, you know, you were much more exposed to disease, much more exposed to, to the various hardships. Um, so you tried to avoid military service as much as possible. Um, to this end, you could write various petitions to the prince to be exempted from those Canton drafts. Um, and typically, exemptions could be that, for example, you're the only son in the family and therefore need to support, support your family. Um, or if you're married and have children, then certainly you would be exempted. Um, or if you came from any of the wealthier families or you helped run the family business, that sort of thing. Um, so there were lots and lots of exemptions you could claim, um, which means that ultimately the soldiers who were still exposed and still dragged into the system um, were the poorest of the poor, generally. Um, so it was the, you know, the younger sons of large farming families and, and, and that sort of thing. Because um, the other thing that wealthier families could do is they could buy replacements. Um, so you could actually pay a, pay a fee to have someone else take your son's spot instead. Um, so that gives you some idea of the social makeup of, of the soldiers themselves. Um, how about the officers? The officers were uh, an interesting bunch, and this is a little bit unique um, in, in central Germany at the time. Um, so Hessen Kassel, uh, typically what you would do in German principalities, it would be your nobles. Um, I mean, this would kind of be the main area of noble service would be to serve the state or to serve the military. Um, so quite a few of them were from the nobility. Um, but hessen kassel being such a small state, relatively speaking, didn't have a very large nobility. And then they had this highly militarized uh, state, of course, and they had these huge regiments relative to their, to their size. So they literally didn't have enough nobles to staff their army. Um, so they could do a couple of things, and they did both of them. Um, one was to recruit noble officers from elsewhere. Um, so you would hire on, I mean, it, kind of national allegiance was sort of a foreign concept at this time. Um, I mean, you might feel a little partial to your principality, but generally speaking, you go where the contracts are and where the money is. Um, and it was perfectly common for officers to change armies um, throughout their career. Uh, you would basically chase conflicts wherever you could because conflicts resulted in, uh, you know, there were financial opportunities there. Um, but so the Hessians would try to hire officers from elsewhere. 
Um, so among the contingent that goes to North America, there are also, for example, Irish officers um, serving in their ranks, um, and certainly German officers from other states. Um, another thing, and this is what's unique to Hessen Kassel, another thing they do is they start promoting commoners to become officers instead. Um, this was really revolutionary for the period. Um, and you can imagine that a lot of noble officers were none too pleased to have commoners in their ranks <laughs> at, their, at their gentlemen's card games and dinners. Um, but up to 60% of the officers who end up serving in the Hessian army in North America were commoners. Um, and so they were promoted through the ranks based on ability, based on education. Um, and so there was actually a vehicle in the Hessian army to promote based on merit. Um, and this was something that was a very new idea in the 18th century. Um, and it's really nothing, it's something that does not become widespread until after the French Revolution. Now, of course, those of you who remember hearing about the Hessians, if you grew up on the East Coast or if you remember it from grade school, probably you'll remember it in the context of plundering, right? As the Hessians have this reputation of being these, uh, you know, barbarous mercenaries who go around plundering. Um, a lot of that is propaganda of the time. Um, they didn't really plunder any more or any less than any other soldiers on the battlefields. Um, and there's an important distinction here that we should identify too, is that plundering civilians was actually prohibited. Um, so soldiers could be punished for that. Um, and there's a simple reason for this in the context of the American Revolution, is that of course they're fighting on British lands, right? That's uh, as far as the British crown was concerned. These were subjects they were trying to return to loyalty to the crown. Um, and so that means you don't really want uh, a foreign army that you're hiring going around and, and plundering the very people that you're trying to bring back into the fold. Um, so what they were allowed to do, however, is capture bounties. Um, so that's the distinction there. So you're not supposed to plunder civilians, but you can capture bounties. Um, capturing bounties basically means capturing enemy materiel. So when they would capture, for example, Fort Knüpphausen, Fort Washington that becomes Fort Knüpphausen, um, officers would get financial reward for the number of cannon they captured or the amount of powder barrels, that sort of thing. Um, or in the river conflicts, you know, capturing enemy vessels would be a financial prize for the officers who were involved. Um, and this has some interesting repercussions later on. So speaking of propaganda, there was quite a bit of it um, in the American War of Independence. Um, and one of the earliest examples involving the Hessians is a little bit of confusion about their origins. Um, so when American newspapers start reporting that the Brits are sending foreigners to their shores to, to quell uh, the, the uprising, um, the, the headlines are about Russians coming to suppress them. Um, and there's a kernel of truth to this. Um, in 1774, when the Brits were going around Europe trying to recruit soldiers, there was an emissary who went to Catherine the Great in Russia and tried to hire 20,000 Russians um, to fight in, in North America. Um, and the Russians sort of had this you know, Eastern barbarous <clears throat> reputation at the time, and so that was, that was something that certainly the press was gonna capitalize on. Um, Catherine does not end up signing that contract. Um, she sort of entertained the notions, but she had her own war, wars with the uh, Turks to worry about and was not interested in, in sending any of her army overseas. Um, but news of those negotiations spread anyway. Um, and so when American newspapers got a hold of that bit of information, um, they used it to great effect to, to grow support for the rebellion. So that basically, the, you know, the Great Britain was, was bringing these barbarous Russians to their, to their shore to suppress them. Um, when then it turned out that they had misunderstood and that those contracts weren't signed, and in fact it was Germans coming to the shores, they simply used the same headlines and just replaced it with Hessians. Um, so now the Hessians were gonna be the, the barbarous. Uh, I mean, so a lot of that language that you see emerging in, in that propaganda about you know, the barbarity of the Hessians um, had just been copied from the earlier uh, articles about the Russians. Um, so the Hessians, generally speaking, most of the Hessians that come over here um, are line troops. Um, so they're trained as, as regular musketeers or grenadiers, um, and they form, you know, kind of the, the stereotypical, as you remember from the Patriot, you know, they form these line, these line battles. Um, there is one particular innovation that the Hessians bring along with them, though, that that's, uh, has interesting repercussions for the war in North America, and that is Jaeger. Um, so Jaeger is the German word that simply means hunter, um, and it describes the, uh, a certain kind of unit that the Germans were recruiting at this time that was, that was very particular to Central Europe. Um, so basically, they were, they were recruiting what amounted to early light infantry units. Um, and these light infantry units were, were dressed differently, equipped differently, and, and had very distinct missions from the rest of the army. Um, so as the name suggests, uh, they were recruited primarily from among hunters, um, also foresters, um, but you know, people with outdoors experience of, of all stripe. Um, 
And basically the idea was is that you, if, you, if you recruited a bunch of people who were used to working in the outdoors, who were used to firing rifles as opposed to muskets, you know, with rifle barrels that were a little bit more complicated to maintain and a little bit more difficult to operate, um, that, you could re that you could put these kinds of guys together in a single unit and have them uh, be tasked with sort of more, more specific missions than the regular line infantry troops. And so this early light infantry outfit would do things like they would scream the army while they were while they were marching, so they would you know protect the flanks and that sort of thing. Um, they would also be uh, the ones manning outposts around their their garrisons. Um, they would also be on sort of what we would now consider more like special forces missions, kind of out on their own and out among the population, collecting intelligence, um, hoping to sway hearts and minds, um, and also chasing down uh, you know the insurgents that were part of the the American um, rebellion. So chasing down militia and that sort of thing. Um, that would be difficult for line troops to do. Um, the way that the line troops have to operate um, does not suit them well for, for example, fighting in, in, in forested areas. Um, but when you have a unit that's used to working independently, that's worse to, used to working in that sort of environment and thinking creatively, um, that's who can accomplish that mission. And so the Jaeger actually play a, a disproportionate role in, in combating um, the, the American revolutionaries off the battlefield. Um, so in these smaller uh, skirmishes throughout New, New York and New Jersey and in the, in the Southern Campaign as well. Um, they were so effective at what they did that the British actually ended up signing additional supplementary treaties in 1777 specifically to get more of these guys. Um, unfortunately for the British, part of the problem is, is that um, Jaeger in this period were born not made. Um, so you really had to find people who had grown up as, as foresters or hunters that would have the special skill set that you needed for a unit like this. And once they had sent off that original complement over to North America, recruiting replacements was really difficult because they pretty much had uh, run that well dry <laughs> over in, in Central Europe. Um, and so a lot of the Jaeger officers note in their diaries later on in the war when the replacements for their units come in that they're completely unqualified for the service. Um, so this was, this was uh, necessarily a small group of people they could draw from, um, and definitely the quality started lacking once they had to replace those units. Um, this would have an interesting lineage beyond the American War of Independence. Jaeger units would play a central role in development of British light infantry, um, and Jaeger would also play a, a central role in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Um, Jaeger units eventually um, evolve into, um, I mean, the light infantry units of all kinds of different armies, um, but also specifically you can draw a direct line of lineage to modern uh, mountain warfare units. Um, a lot of the structure is the same and a lot of the approaches are the same. And in fact, um, just in terms of the, uh, yeah, Jaeger was still a, a term used for light infantry units for German light infantry units during World War II. Um, and the name for German mountain troops is Gebirgsjäger, so mountain hunters, um, precisely because of this lineage. Um, among the officers, it's, it's worth noting too, um, the officers tended to be university educated. Um, they would um, try to take military history classes and, and, and some uh, um, technical classes as well. Um, this is actually a map drawn by one of these officers. Um, quite a few of them had, uh, were expert car uh, cartographers. Um, and we continue to use their excellent maps from the conflict to sort of figure out what was going on back then. But so this was a map drawn by one of those Jaeger officers about engagements um, in the New York, uh, New York, New Jersey campaign. Of course, the most famous episode that we know the Hessians from is the infamous Battle of Trenton. Um, you might see every, every year, we see it on social media, the story about Washington surprising the drunk Hessians at Trenton, <laughs> right? Um, and so there's a little bit of a corrective needed there that I think actually highlights what an effective commander Washington was. Um, <laughs> Because I think sort of the story, that stereotypical story of the drunk Hessians actually undermines the accomplishment of, of the uh, American army at this point. Um, so as you know, the, as the story goes, the enlistments of the, of the American, of the Continental Army were, were running out. Um, and Washington basically wanted one last victory in 1776 to convince these guys to sign on for, for an additional enlistment. Um, so he had about four, four to 5,000 men under his command on uh, the western bank of the, of the Delaware River. And right opposite him, the British had set up these outposts along, along the river in the various towns that were there, um, including the town of Trenton. Um, the British had made a few mistakes here. Um, in order to keep as much pressure on Washington as, as possible, um, they wanted to be as close to the river as possible. And so they stretched out their line far too thin 
um, and they didn't really have any depth to their, their defense. Um, and that's really a function of, of them not expecting Washington to, to assault them. Um, I mean, first of all, they had not seen any kind of uh, offensive capability from the Continental Army that, that would have made them think they had to worry about that sort of thing. Um, but also it was unusual, of course, to run a winter campaign. Um, in the 18th century, you would uh, you know, set, up your, set up your camp for the winter and, and get fighting again in the spring. Um, so they were not expecting um, anyone to cross the Delaware, certainly. Um, and even if they did, they would not have expected it to be in, in any kind of uh, sizable force. Um, so they made the mistake of, of being too close to the river, of spreading out too far. Um, and also because they took those, those uh, positions so late in the year, it was also very difficult to build any um, worthwhile defenses. Um, so one of the critiques that people level against um, the, the Hessians is that they didn't fortify the town. Um, well, fortifying a town in December is, is a pretty difficult task. The ground was already frozen. Uh, it would have been difficult to, to build any kind of earthworks or trenches. Um, and so, yeah, they just kind of lived in, lived in the town and um, they had their outposts stationed closer to the river and on the major roads. Um, so they weren't caught completely unawares, um, as the story sometimes is told. Um, but generally speaking, yes, I mean, the town was not in a, in a good position to be defended. Um, so in December 1776 then, um, Washington in secret managed to cross the Delaware with 4,000 troops. Um, he had another contingent that was supposed to cross elsewhere and, and was not able to, um, so it should have been an even larger force. Um, and they marched on the town of Trenton where they knew a Hessian brigade was quartered, um, a brigade of about 900 soldiers. Um, so very quickly they ran into the outposts of these Hessian Jaegers. Um, so that part of the story is already not, not quite true. Um, so they weren't completely surprised. They ran into these outposts, and the outposts fought a fighting retreat and immediately alerted the town. So by the time American forces got to the town, all three of the regiments had already assembled for combat. Um, so they were fully lined up and, and ready to go. Um, so that's another part of the story that's sort of eclipsed, um, is that they, they were not surprised by the time they got to the town. They, they were ready for battle. Um, as the American troops then came in, um, at 4,000 to 900. Um, those, are, those are not great odds for the Hessians, of course. Um, one of the things that uh, the Hessians can be faulted for is that um, in typical 18th century fashion, um, in the months preceding, or in the month preceding this, um, the commanding colonel in the town would host these fancy dinners um, for all of his noble officers. And they would invite um, local people of prominence to join them. Um, I mean, this was a common practice in the 18th century. You'd play some cards, have a nice dinner. Um, and so you'd invite the, the locals who were of the same kind of social class that could enjoy that kind of interaction. Um, but that, of course, means that you're not inviting necessarily people loyal to the crown. <laughs> um, and word got out about some of the defenses and, and certainly the, the strength of the town of Trenton. Um, and word got over to Washington. And that's how they planned this particular assault, is that they knew exactly how many guys they were facing, um, thanks to these kind of Hessian uh, lapses in, in operational security. Um, so by the time they, they got here with their 4,000 troops and started surrounding the town, um, it basically was already too late. Um, there was really no hope for the Hessians to hold the town of Trenton against those odds and in a town that was not fortified in any way. Um, so they assembled, as you can see here, the red, the red squares there, um, assembled for, for combat, but very quickly uh, were turned away, um, turned to a field outside of town, um, and, then, and then surrendered there. Um, and this famous uh, Don Triani painting here, you can also see another thing that happened very early on in the conflict to, to, to complicate things during that battle. And that is that the commanding officer, Colonel Rall, that you see there on horseback, he and his XO both got onto horses in order to command their, their troops more easily and were very quickly picked off by American riflemen because um, they were <laughs> literally head and shoulders above everyone else, made for easy targets. Um, so there were very few casualties among the Hessians, but they were all high ranking. Um, and so this also helped create a whole bunch of confusion um, as, you know, um, among the smoke of, uh, generated by all these black powder weapons, now your, your executive officer is down, your, your commanding officer is down, um, so the officers themselves weren't sure who was supposed to take charge next, um, and very quickly it all descends into chaos. Um, interesting to note, too, on the northern flank here, um, there were a lot of Germans among the Continental Army as well, um, and those Germans were shouting demands of surrender over at the, at the Hessians. Um, and so very quickly, with, with relatively few casualties, the whole thing starts breaking down um, and those regiments start surrendering. Um, they hadn't really been left with an exit, as you can see here. They're almost completely encircled in this pocket here. A few of them managed to escape over that creek that you see there, the Asimput Creek, um, and make it out of there. Um, but by and large, I mean, the, the regiments are captured successfully by Washington. And it's a, it's a huge American victory. 
Um, I mean, this is something that they really capitalize on in propaganda, of course, as well. Um, but it, it really is true. They're not exaggerating at all the size of this victory. Um, and not only does it take an entire Hessian brigade out of action, but it also gives the Continental Army, importantly, its first large contingent of prisoners of war. Um, and at the, in the 18th century, what was common practice was to trade your prisoners whenever you could. Um, and so having some prisoners after those disastrous New York, New Jersey campaigns um, was a really important thing. Um, so yeah, they captured almost 900 um, Hessian prisoners. Um, and what's interesting here is a few things that, that come out of this as well. Um, so not only do they now have potentially fodder for this, for this sort of prisoner exchange, um, but it's really the first time that Hessians and Americans get to see each other up close. Um, so the American newspapers, you know, as I mentioned earlier, had been reporting about these barbarous Russians, no wait Hessians, um, that are coming over to, to quell the uprising. Um, but now they actually get a chance to interact on a, on a personal level. Um, and unsurprisingly, they find a lot of commonalities, right? I mean, they're, they're regular line troops or even among the officers, they have a lot of the same hobbies, a lot of the same interests, read a lot of the same books, um, and they get a chance to interact and, and actually become a bit friendly with one another. Um, the Hessian prisoners are escorted first to Pennsylvania. Quite a few of them are kept in Lancaster um, in some prison barracks there. Others are brought down to Virginia. Um, and then uh, Washington starts negotiating with, with exchanging prisoners. Um, interesting to note, too, is that Washington personally made a huge impression on the Hessians captured at Trenton. Um, not only as a military commander in terms of pulling off this, this amazing feat of you know, moving 4,000 inexperienced troops across the river and, and assaulting the town the way they had, um, and then following up immediately with the Battle of Princeton as well, um, but also on a personal level. Um, he, for example, allowed the officers to keep their swords, which was a, a nice gesture um, as they entered captivity. Um, there was also one officer who had, um, you know, in, the, in, in getting ready to defend the town, um, had left behind all of his papers in his, in his room in Trenton. Um, and so as he was entering captivity, he asked Washington, you know, I've got these personal papers, could I, could I retrieve them? And Washington sent one of his soldiers to go into the town and retrieve the papers for this officer, um, which, which really impressed them, that he really acted like a, like a gentleman. Um, and, uh, you know, against the the backdrop of this, this ineffective army they had seen in, in New York and New Jersey, now they were seeing Washington in a whole new light, that he was a, a consummate military professional um, that sort of operated in the same way that they were used to. Yeah, Bill. Did you turn them over immediately or did they read them first? <laughs> <laughs> so the, what happens with the Hessian prisoners is interesting. So the, the Brits, um, you know, the Brits had captured an awful lot, of, and with the Hessian help, of course, right? They had ca captured an awful lot of um, militia and, and Continental Army soldiers early in the campaign. Um, and they housed them on these infamous prison ships in New York Harbor, right? Or tons of them expired. Um, the British were hesitant to negotiate for prisoner releases with the Americans. Um, and their reasoning was is that negotiating with the, with the Americans over prisoners of war would legitimize the American effort, right? So if you're actually negotiating with them, that sort of is a recognition that they have some kind of authority or power. Um, and so the Brits were not interested in negotiating for prisoners. Um, and up until this point, they didn't have to worry about it because the Americans weren't taking a whole lot of British soldiers prisoner. Um, but now that the Hessians have been taken prisoner, what was interesting is that the Hess Hessen Kassel, um, as you know, the largest contract state, one of the clauses they had built into their contract was that the Hessian units operated more or less independently under British command, um, which meant that they were, you know, the regiments were officered by their own officers. <coughs> Um, and they often were sent off on these missions on their own, such as in Trenton when they had been stationed there. Uh, you know, it was just a Hessian brigade. There were no British soldiers there. Um, but the Hessians, therefore, um, did not have the same uh, qualms as the Brits did with negotiating uh, with, with Americans. Um, so this was the first opportunity that Washington had to negotiate for prisoners because it was not with the British, but rather with the Hessians directly that he could negotiate. Um, and so they start negotiating for prisoner exchanges and, and, and other such things. Um, the Hessians during this time, what's also interesting to note is, is prisoners of war were handled very differently during this period than what we're used to now. Um, your home country was still expected to pay and feed you while you were in captivity. Um, so they had uh, special arrangements for these, these um, basically prison supply runs where um, you know, there would be a, a basically a Hessian quartermaster with a small escort um, and they would have their couple covered wagons full of replacement uniforms and, and basically gold to pay the, to pay the soldiers. Um, and they would get special, they would make special arrangements with the Americans. They would bring them behind the American lines and, and hand out these supplies and pay. Um, soldiers would go down to half pay while they were in captivity since they weren't actively fighting. Um, but you know, it was the responsibility of, of the home country to supply them. Um, 
Unfortunately, on the flip side, that of course meant that the Brits and, and Hessians both felt that the American government was responsible, or the American army, uh, the Continental Army, was responsible for um, paying and supplying um, American prisoners in their hands. And um, the Congress was in no position to do that early on in the war. Um, and so a lot of that also resulted in that, in that misery on those prison ships is that the Brits felt that they had no responsibility to care for these men. Um, but so they start negotiating and there's, um, they also use these guys as, as leverage um, in terms of the mistreatment of prisoners. Um, so rumors start reaching Washington about these prison ships and how soldiers are being treated. Um, and so he makes an announcement that you know, he has heard that, that they're mistreating officers as well. And he said, for every American, uh, uh, the, I might be misremembering the exact details, but anyway, he was saying basically, for every American officer that you hang, we're gonna hang five Hessians. Um, and the Hessians sort of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort of the wake up call to them. And they say, hang on a second, <laughs> that's not us, that's the Brits. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that helps reinforce the direct negotiations between Washington and, and the Hessians. Um, so Trenton was that, that first major uh, Hessian episode with the, with the Continental Army. Um, the following year, there would be another one um, where another independent Hessian command would get itself into some trouble. Um, and that would uh, sort of set the tone for the rest of the campaign for the Hessians. Um, in Red Bank, New Jersey, um, was a fortified fort on the, on the river there um, that, the, that the Hessians were supposed to assault. Um, and if you recall earlier on, I told you about the, the importance of bounties to these officers, right? So if you capture enemy materiel, it would be a huge financial reward. Um, well, you had the, uh, a Hessian colonel, um, Carl Emil Fogonup, um, who, who took his soldiers and wanted to take the fort. And his ambition basically was it will be named Fort Donup by the next morning. Um, and he would capture a whole bunch of enemy soldiers and all of their materiel, and he would gain a, you know, not only prestige, but a lot of financial reward from this. But in order to assault the fort effectively, he really needed support from the river. Um, really, the, the best way to have done it would have been to have some British um, river-faring vessels come down and, and help with artillery fire onto the fort from another flank. But the Brits told him, sure, we can do that for you, but then we'll get all the bounties once you take the fort. <coughs> And he said, no, thank you, <laughs> and uh, decided to assault the fort without that support. Um, and it was a devastating loss. Um, the fort was on a height. Um, it was well fortified. They had good lanes of fire. Um, and as the Hessians came marching up the hill, they got mowed down. Um, 200 of them were killed in action, including uh, Donop himself. Um, they were buried just outside the fort. And you may have seen, I think it was last year, there was some news. Um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a historic park today. Um, they found some more of those Hessian corpses recently um, that have been uh, sort of, the, the ground has been eroding, and so they found some of those, some of those corpses. Um, but yeah, it was a devastating loss for the Hessians, um, and you know, at issue had been those bounties. Um, but between Trenton and Red Bank, um, the British commanders then decided this was, this was the end of sort of this Hessian experimentation of letting them off on their, on their own devices. Um, so the Hessian regiments would still be officered by their own officers, um, but from here on out, they would not be sent off on their own independent missions. From here on out, it would be under British command that they would operate. Um, ultimately, the Hessian soldiers, um, so uh, German soldiers of, of all stripe, um, made up a third of the British forces in North America, so quite a, quite a huge percentage. Um, and in a lot of the campaigns, they made up 50% of the actual combat troops. Um, so the Hessians had a huge influence on the, on the American campaign in that way. Quick note on rewards and punishment for the officers um, and men alike. Um, so I mentioned you know, the bounties. That could be a, a way that, that officers could enrich themselves on campaign. Um, there were a couple of other mechanisms by which they could be recognized for exemplary service. Um, a lot of this was, was heavily delayed, of course, because of the long time it would take for letters to travel across the Atlantic and back. Um, but by and large, the Prince of hessen kassel was very interested in recognizing his officers for good work. Um, a lot of this had to do with social prestige, but some of it was also you know, financial enrichment and career development and that sort of thing. Um, so one of the things that he had developed early on in his reign was a new medal that would be a Medal of Military Merit that could be awarded, of course, only to officers, not to enlisted men. Um, and this medal would come with a pension. Um, so at the end of your career, when you retire, you would gain an additional pension if you were a knight of this order, of this Military Merit Medal. Um, so it had a French name, Pour la Vertu Militaire, so for, mil for military virtue. Um, and he kept close tabs on the activities in North America and then personally decided which officers were eligible for this award. Um, so he had sent the commanding general over to North America with 25 of these medals um, in his baggage um, so that he had a ready supply for when the first medals would be awarded. 
Um, some of them were sort of predictably for sort of uh, you know grand gestures. Um, so for example, the first officer to step off the boat on Staten Island got one of these. <laughs> so he hadn't really accomplished anything, but he was the first one off the boat. Um, but in other cases, uh, you know, these were awarded based on um, you know not only feedback from his own generals in the field, but from the Brits as well. Um, so the British commanders would write the Prince of Hessen Kassel to, to report on how his soldiers were doing, and when they would name officers specifically for having done a particularly exemplary job, um, that might qualify them to get this medal. Um, there's one officer in particular, a Jaeger officer, who gets it um, and, and, and certainly deserved it for, for his uh, handling of his troops. Um, but in his diary, he noted, you know, he was, he was pleased that he received the award, um, but he also couldn't help but think that back in the day, this would have come with a title of nobility and some land <laughs> instead of just a pretty medal and a small pension. Um, in terms of punishments, um, those, were, those were fairly severe in the Hessian army. Um, for officers, not so much. There wasn't such a thing as corporal punishment for the officers, but the officers could face court-martials. Um, and after the Battle of Trenton, when you know, 900 Hessians had surrendered, uh, of course, the Prince of hessen kassel was very concerned about what his officers had done in that battle. Um, conveniently, the court-martial found and, and all the judges found that the, really the blame lay with the two guys who had been killed in the battle. <laughs> so the, the commanding officer and the XO, of course, were really at fault. Um, but immediately after news of Trenton reached hessen kassel uh, he ordered every single officer to be put on trial um, that had been there. Um, and the trial started while these officers were still in captivity <laughs> and could not represent their, themselves uh, in front of the court. Um, but the court was made up of various officers, some of whom who had served in, in North America. The trial lasted almost seven years before it, it reached a final conclusion. Um, and what's interesting is, I mean, there's hundreds of pages that survive from these, from these uh, court records. Um, and they had, you know, it's actually fairly modern in its approach. I mean, they had these standard interview questions. They would ask all these guys, I mean, enlisted men as well who were there to get all the details straight. Um, but yes, ultimately they found that, you know, the blame really lay with the commanding officer and the XO for not... Um, uh, for, 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 for the loss at the Battle of Trenton. What's interesting is that they were not found guilty of losing the town or of losing the battle. Um, basically, the court martial found that really those were overwhelming odds and there was nothing they could have done differently to win the day. What they should have done is organize a retreat. Um, and so that's basically what they faulted those two high-ranking officers for, is not recognizing the situation quickly enough and organizing a, treat, uh, a retreat and you know, fighting their way out of that, that pocket. Um, and saving the brigade that way. So that's an interesting detail, is that the, you know, the court found that really there was no way to win the Battle of Trenton, but they should have preserved the brigade. Oh, um, one last note on punishment. So enlisted men, of course, they could face corporal punishment. Um, and the main, the main way that this was done was by running the gauntlet. Um, that was still a common practice in the 18th century, um, where basically your punishment was meted out by your fellow soldiers. Um, so if you were found guilty uh, of a serious enough crime that warranted running the gauntlet, um, typically you'd have to run it multiple times. Um, you would, the, the rest of your unit would line up um, and be handed a whole bunch of wooden sticks, basically, and bats. Um, and the offending soldier would have to run between these two ranks while everyone else beat at them with these sticks. Um, and so basically it was your fellow soldiers who were dealing out the punishment to you because, generally speaking, the crimes that warranted that kind of punishment, for example, desertion, was a crime against your unit. Um, and therefore, they should take an active, per, uh, you know, they should be actively participating in punishing you for it. Yes, sir. That's interesting. I, I just uh, wonder because the American Indians had the same kind mm -hmm. of punishment gauntlet uh, for prisoners. Uh, any connection? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I know the, the Germans have been doing this for quite a long time. Um, this was a common practice in a lot of European armies at this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this a word um, coming mm -hmm. from? Uh, Europe any way related to Washington and the Purple Heart? Um, only in the way that I think, I mean, in the late 18th century is the first time where militaries are starting to do this kind of, uh, or, or every military is starting to develop its own ways of recognizing um, soldiers and officers. Um, so before this, the Prussians were, the, were among the, the earlier ones to, to do this kind of award. They did it in time for, um, I think they already had it in 1740, they had their award. It looked almost exactly like this. This is very much an unabashed copy of that Prussian award. The difference was, you can see the rearing, I mean, not very well, but you, these are rearing lions in between the cross there. Um, on the Prussian version, it's eagles. Um, and the colors are slightly different to represent the, the Prussian national colors. Um, but so a lot of uh, armies in this period are developing these kinds of awards and recognitions for their soldiers. So, so in that way, it's Washington related. was in line with yep. following 
Exactly. What yep. others were doing. Yep, exactly. Um, so the question of desertion always comes up as well. Um, there certainly was desertion in the Hessian army, um, but there was less, and it happened less early than um, you might suspect, and, and less early than uh, the Continental Congress certainly hoped. Um, so in fact, there's a, there's a commission that's put together by the Continental Congress early on in the conflict, um, and Jefferson himself serves on that committee. Um, and basically, they try to entice the Hessians, you know, we have all these foreign troops coming to our shore, how can we entice them to leave that British service? Um, and what's sort of interesting is the way that they interpret this, this committee, I mean, despite the fact that the newspapers are talking about these barbarous Russians on their way over, over the Atlantic, um, the way that Jefferson and this committee look at it is they say, you know, these guys are no different from the oppressed people living under the British crown <laughs> in, in general, right? Um, these people are, are ripe for turning. Um, you know, they're, they're living in this oppressive uh, German state. They're, they're the poorest of the poor. They're forced to serve in this army. They're sent across the Atlantic, which was a, a terrifying journey at this, at this time in history um, and not something that people would take lightly. Um, and so they figured, you know, these guys are, are just ready to throw down their muskets when they get here. So we, sh we should think of ways to entice them to leave. Um, and so the committee comes up with a couple different plans. They come up with leaflets to, to you know, clandestinely throw in their trenches at night and that sort of thing. Um, and they also offer bounties um, to these soldiers to, to leave their units. Um, the Congress doesn't have a whole lot of money at this point, um, but they do have land that they can give away or promise away anyway. Um, and so they promise free farmland, basically, to these, to these Hessian soldiers to leave their units and, uh, you know, if not join the Allied cause, at least not, or uh, join the American cause, at least not uh, continue serving the, the English crown. Um, this plan doesn't really go anywhere. Um, and uh, Congress is sort of disappointed by this, but, um, you know, from the perspective of these Hessian soldiers, they're in a strange land. Um, and so even though you have great farmland nearby, I mean, it's also frontier land in many respects, um, and especially the land that was being offered at Bounties, they knew it was not going to be, you know, a plot of uh, Main Street in Philadelphia. No, you're going to be off on the, <laughs> you're gonna be off on the, uh, the wilds of, of Pennsylvania, right? Um, and so uh, quite a few of the Hessians, or the, you know, the Hessians generally refuse to take the, the Congress up on these offers. Um, they're not really interested early on in the conflict. Um, as the war drags on, however, it becomes more and more of a problem. Um, and it's less so that it's the hardship of the war wearing down these troops, and rather more so the quality of the replacements coming over from Europe. Um, so basically, once they run out of that pool that I was talking about earlier, you know, especially among the, the Jaeger, it, you know, that's felt very clearly that you have unqualified replacements. Um, but for the rest of the army as well, they sort of start running out of the, the optimal candidates for military service. Um, and instead, what you start running into is a lot of clever young people over in Central Europe who see this as a free ride to North America. <laughs> and so they will sign up with recruiters, um, get, you know, they collect their recruiting bonus and whatever else, they get their free uniform, um, they hop on uh, the, the boats across the Atlantic, and they disappear immediately when they come to North America. Yes, sir. Uh, don't you think it also at that point in the war, the, at, or at the beginning of the war, it was pretty clear that they expected to win, mm -hmm. and so these promises from the the defeated army are not going to be very uh, useful. But more towards the yeah. end, it made it look, look a little bit more like maybe there would be a government yeah. to give them this land. Yeah, I'm sure that played a role as well. Um, and I think the earlier soldiers too, though, were interested in getting back home. <laughs> so you could promise them as much land as you want, but they have they have families and, and plots of land and businesses and whatever else waiting back for them in central Germany that they don't want to spend the time here. Um, so there's been some analysis done on Hessian deserters because we have the, the muster rolls and we have an awful lot of documentation for these guys that, that still survives to this day. And you find that bar, by and large, and this is not surprising, it's the absolute poorest of the poor soldiers who end up taking up these, these offers to desert. So it's really the guys who have nothing to return back home to um, that suddenly have these opportunities in North America and, and seize on them. Any idea on percentages that stay uh, in yes. the yeah, let me, uh, oh, um, yeah, I can talk about that now. Um, so ultimately it's about, um, I mean, the numbers are a little, little, little rough, but uh, so it, it ends up being roughly 40,000 Germans that end up serving in North America at some point or another in the British Army or as, as part of the contingent. Um, that includes replacements, it includes, um, I mean, replacements both for losses sustained, but also there, are, there is some rotation among the troops too, where their terms end and they go back to Europe, that sort of thing. Um, so it's never 40,000 at one time serving here, but it's 40,000 overall that are involved in the system. Um, I think it's 12,000, at the, at the end of the war, it's about, it's just under 30,000 that are over here. 
about half return, and the half that don't return, about half of those were killed or, or died in service, and the other half remained, um, either as, as deserters um, or at the end of the conflict, quite a few of them are offered the chance to stay voluntarily. Um, so the new government is eager for, you know, new farmers, basically, for the, for, to settle the, the lands that they have. Um, and the German princes, to some extent, are eager for the chance to get rid of some of these deadbeats um, <laughs> that are clogging up their countryside. Um, and so a lot of petitions are accepted by the German princes at the end of the war. So these are not deserters, but these are people who, who formally apply to stay in North America and not go back across the Atlantic. Um, and so there's, I think the number is about 5,000 that we think that stay there. Um, that's, that's, that stay here and become citizens either of Canada or of the, of the new United States. Is there a researcher, re researchability for that list? Yes. Um, in fact, it's digitized. Um, so oh. you, can, you can search online. Um, it's called the Hetrina. Um, I can give you the, the reference no, for that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, so a lot of these muster rolls are, are online and there's, there's good information there. Um, so meanwhile, a note at home. So you have Landgrave Friedrich II, who is cashing in big time on, on this uh, rental agreement, right? Um, and as the war drags on especially, he's getting these really juicy subsidy payments, um, and then he's going to get them for a couple years after the end of the conflict as well. So what does he do with all this money? Um, so the reputation that the German princes had for the longest time was, well, they're these, you know, uh, opulent mercenary princes who are just throwing this money at their private parties, building new palaces, um, and you know, doing it by selling the, the blood of their people. Um, that was sort of the reputation. And that's certainly true for some of those princes. Um, some of them, that's absolutely what they do. They cash these big checks and they build themselves fancy new palaces and they host big parties and that sort of thing. Friedrich II is a little bit different. Um, he sees an opportunity here for his state to become a much more important player in European politics. And he sees the army as the vehicle for that. So he's got a fairly small state. He's got a small tax base. Um, he's never really going to be of any consequence if he relies on that alone. But through renting out the army, he suddenly has this major, important, and, and hugely um, um, valuable export that he can offer to the states around him. Um, so he sees this as an opportunity to gain influence and to gain uh, importance for his state. And so he reinvests a lot of this money into his state military apparatus. Um, so, for example, in 17, actually, he, when he came to power already, he had started drafting plans for, for modernizing his army um, and, for example, throwing money at that new military award that would come with this uh, nice pension for those, those officers who awarded it. He also founded a brand new military academy. Um, and it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, it gets founded in, in 1776. Um, uh, they think starts accepting the first students in 1778. Um, but it's very much a model that will be familiar to anyone who knows about how West Point operates um, or how it operated early on. Um, but so you would apply to it. Um, in, in the German case, you had to be a noble, of course, to, to apply for it. Um, but if you were accepted, it was, it was free education. Um, and it was a very good education. Um, he hired some of the best um, professors around from the local universities. They would teach courses on engineering, on, on cartography, on uh, you know, various military sciences. Um, and these young guys would be taken in at the age of seven or eight um, and then sent off and then they would get commissioned at 17, 16, 17 um, to be sent off to their units. Um, so it was a pretty progressive and, and new system. Um, in this case, it was not a vehicle for meritocracy the way that combat commissions were because um, you had to be noble. Um, but really the reason for that was is that they didn't want to waste time having to teach people how to read <laughs> or how to you know, behave in social circumstances, that sort of thing. So it was assumed that if you're taking noble sons the basic building blocks are already there, and you can send them straight to the classroom. Um, but so he, he built that. He also built this building that you see in the background here, the Fridericianum, um, which was the world's first purpose-built public museum. Um, so he thought that you know, public education was hugely important. There was free admission to this. Um, and he basically put his private collection on display um, so that people could come from all over Europe to, to marvel at pieces of antiquity, at, at wonderful art, and that sort of thing. Um, he had a huge collection there, um, especially of antiquities. Um, interesting to note, too, the ledger books, um, the guest books from the, from the early days of the museum have survived as well. Um, one of the students who comes from the nearby University of Göttingen to go look at the collection is a young uh, British guy named John Andre, um, who might be familiar from his later uh, exploits in the American Revolution. Um, so he was, he was at this museum as well. So none of this was destroyed in World War II? All of it was destroyed. This is, this is all rebuilt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kassel was 80% was leveled during the war. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the statue as well. Um, that's the original uh, Friedrich statue there. I think they hid the statue during the war, um, but yeah, the whole square was destroyed. 
Um, so when he comes to the end of the war in 1783, once the Brits are finally able to, or, or willing to throw in the towel and, and negotiate the end of the, the conflict, um, you know, what does this mean for the Hessians? And what's interesting is that the Hessians, when they return back to Europe, are welcomed as heroes. They're thrown victory parades when they come back to Kassel. And that's because, as far as the Germans were concerned, the conduct of the British campaign didn't matter at all. They performed well, they performed professionally, um, they had developed, you know, a, a, a developed further militarily in terms of their, their skills and abilities, they had built their reputation. As far as the Hessians were concerned, this was a victory all the way around. Um, they had got, you know, gotten a ton of money for their state, um, and they had you know, good prospects going forward. And in fact, when the French Revolutionary Wars erupt shortly thereafter in Europe, um, the Brits come back to Hessen again to try to hire more regiments there. Um, so as far as the Hessians are concerned, this is a victory, despite the fact that ultimately the military mission itself was lost. Um, for them, it was, it was victory accomplished all the way around. In terms of the legacies here, um, on the left is a, is a portrait done of a, an elderly Hessian veteran in Philadelphia. So he's one of those 5,000 who stayed here. Um, quite a few of them became you know, prominent members of, their, of the new American society um, and, and helped form uh, you know, the communities in, in New York and Pennsylvania especially and also in, in uh, Canada. Um, on the other hand, Hessen Kassel, what happens to Hessen Kassel? Well, as I mentioned, you know, they stick around and they keep the military system around for the French Revolutionary Wars. Um, fairly successful there and still make tons more money. Um, and then a guy named Napoleon comes along, um, and Napoleon, in his effort to build the French Empire, decides that Hessen Kassel is one of these annoying obstacles in the way um, and puts them on a list of countries to be eradicated. Um, and when the French army comes marching in, the small Hessian state cannot um, stand up against the, the French army. There's just no way. Um, so the, the elector of Hessen Kassel at that point, who was the son of Friedrich II, um, runs away with the treasury um, and some of his, his senior uh, household and staff members. Um, and they basically have a government in exile for a short while. Um, Hessen Kassel is incorporated into a new kingdom of Westphalia, as they call it, um, which Napoleon hands over to his brother Jerome to run. Um, and Jerome uh, is sort of an interesting character. He, he sort of seizes it as his responsibility to bring the Enlightenment to Central Europe. Never mind, it's already been there. Um, but he wants to bring French Enlightenment there anyway. And uh, he's all excited to become the ruler of this new German state that he's going to bring into the, into the 19th century. Um, and at some point, he, he makes some suggestions to Napoleon, you know, oh, I'd like to, to reorganize this and fund that. And Napoleon writes back, what are you doing? Your job is to tax this place to death and, and to recruit soldiers for my army. Um, so Napoleon is not interested in any kind of actual state in Westphalia. Um, he really just wants to extract money and, and soldiers from it. Um, Westphalians end up serving uh, in the French army as part of that conscript army. Um, and tens of thousands of them die in the campaign against Russia in 1812. Um, the majority of the soldiers, the French soldiers, um, who invade Russia so dis disastrously in that campaign are actually Germans um, recruited from Central Europe. Um, so this contributes to the already bad feeling towards Napoleon and his empire. And so in 1813, when uh, the Prussians decide to switch sides and fight Napoleon again, um, they very quickly find allies in Central Europe, including in Westphalia, who are ready to rise up against the French um, and join the new coalition army to, to kick Napoleon's butt at Waterloo. So in terms of researching the revolution, so this whole project came out of uh, the amazing archives that have been maintained. Um, and that's really due to some of the other initiatives that Friedrich II passed during his reign. Um, so one of those is that, I mean, this is kind of the emergence of the modern state is he thought it was really important to keep records of everything. <laughs> um, and so he demanded, for example, regular reports from all of his commanders in, in North America. Um, as the, the officers came back and some of them had written personal diaries, he would get copies of those diaries to add to the state archives as well. Um, he even spent money on a commission to write an official military history of his state. Um, and so he engaged some professors and, and officers to be involved in that as well. So the end result of that is, is that we have an amazingly complete record of this service that has survived to the present day. Um, it's housed here in Marburg, Germany, in the Hessian State Archives. Um, so Hessen, even though it you know, ceased to exist then as an, as an independent state, um, uh, it still has its, its own state archives there. Um, Interestingly, this building that you see here was one of Hitler's personal projects in 1938, um, part of the uh, uh, various building projects around the country, and one of them was this purpose-built archive. Um, and so it's a pretty cool building um, uh, as such. You know, it was actually built to, to suit its current purpose, whereas most archives tend to be housed in whatever government buildings available at the time. Um, this was actually specifically built for that. It has a wonderful reading room. 
Um, and what's kind of neat is, you know, when you research the American Revolution over here and you go to the National Archives or you go to archives on the East Coast, um, you know, you put on your gloves and you do it under supervision and it's all, you know, it's a lot of process to look at these original documents because, well, they're from our founding. They're hugely important. They're rare. They're delicate. Um, over in Germany, 18th century is like yesterday. Um, so when you go to request, you know, documents from the 18th century in the German archives, here they go. They bring you this huge folder. You can just leaf through it. Um, and they just have hundreds and hundreds of, of reports and letters and diaries and maps um, related to the service that are, that are ready to access for researchers, which is really amazing. Um, in German. In German, yes. And in the old German script, which you have to learn first, too. Yes. But, <laughs> but it, nevertheless, it's an amazing record. Um, and it was really a, an amazing pleasure working in this collection and, and putting, putting that together, this little slice. So ultimately, I wrote a, my dissertation on this. Um, I haven't thought about it in years. Um, and so thank you again for inviting me and giving me a chance to, to talk about it some more. And um, I'm open to, to any questions you might have. Yes. I was interested, back to the Jaeger units, yeah. I was interested in the uniforms. And if you look mm -hmm. at that uh, slide that you have, it has a green tunic. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so that reminds me of, of course, the forestry mm -hmm. of the Jaegers. Yeah, you have any, can you expand on the uniforms at all and, and the significance and, and mm -hmm. uh, symbolism? Yeah, so the, the green, you know, you, it, it's tempting to think it's an early version of camouflage. Um, there's not really any indication that that's the way it was used. Um, but really the units, what was important for commanders on the field, I mean, when you think about 18th century battle and you have all these line infantry regiments, communication is hugely difficult and getting an overview of the battle is extremely difficult, especially with all the black powder going off all over the place. Um, so really the main function of the uniform is to make the individual units as recognizable as possible. And so you had, a, like the different regiments then, that's how they would distinguish themselves, is they would have the different colored jackets and then the facings would be different colors. So let's say, you know, the one infantry regiment would be blue and white and then the next one would be blue and yellow. Um, and so in that way, the, the Jaegers were the green and red. Um, by coincidence, the one unit in the British Army that was sort of similar in organization and mission to them was the Queen's Rangers, um, and they also chose green as their, as their color. They were in the South, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Bill. The other thing to bring out, too, is one of the great ways to get young men to join the Army is give them a cool-looking uniform. <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> yeah. What kind of money are we talking? We're renting these units, so what... Yeah. Yeah, um, what kind of money? That's always tricky to sort of put in modern context because, of course, I mean, it's, it's pounds and then it's German dollars and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. But to give you some idea, um, let's see, in... What was the statistic? I used this in my dissertation because it was just a way of, of highlighting it. So the, the investments made with money from the American Revolution um, in 1820 yielded the Hessian government, like the interest off of those investments yielded more money than the taxation of the entire state. I mean, so it was huge. It was, uh, yeah, it was enormous. Yeah. Was it paid in gold back then? Or? It would have been, or yeah, in, in, in various currents. I mean, mix of gold and silver and, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little different question. How does the uh, word Jaeger relate to Jaeger schnitzel? <laughs> <laughs> so the hunter schnitzel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's the way that the, that the, you know, at least the hunters of the time enjoyed their schnitzel was with the mushroom sauce, as Jaeger opposed to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the Jaeger mushroom, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, it's all related back to this word. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> One of the things I found interesting is when you were talking about the newspapers with Germans or Russians, and then you went on to mention that a lot of the Germans stayed, mm -hmm. you know, here in the country, settled in Pennsylvania. If you look forward to the Civil War, you know, there were the whole Union Army Fifth Corps was mostly mm -hmm. made up of Germans, and at Chancellorsville, the Fifth Corps broke and ran when mm -hmm. Jackson made his flank march. And those troops became known as the Flying Dutchmen. Uh, 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 <laughs> but the word for German was Deutsch. Yeah. So they were really Deutschmen, but you know, the Americans, because they, yeah. they turned it into Dutchmen, yeah. and so the Dutch got uh, kind of branded with being yeah. you know, deserters and cowards, but it was really German. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with the origins of the Pennsylvania Dutch, right? That was also a mis misnomer. They're, yeah. They're German, mm -hmm. right. yeah. Well, Chris, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much.
please come and visit some more. Any yeah, other questions you might have? And both upstairs, too, if you haven't seen the latest Tenth Mountain Division exhibit. And Chris, I'm sure we got a lot of that info from you as well. So 